Tory. Nothing personal word of the day. It's a Samson sit down and we got him. We found a way to get him to give us 45 minutes of his time, if Coca likes it enough to last 45 minutes. It's Pablo Torre. You know him. You've read his articles, unbelievable articles. You've heard him on his shows on ESPN. You have paid attention to his points of view because he's right almost 20% of the time, which wow. makes him way better than almost anyone who does what we do. <laughs> and hopefully you download and subscribe to his podcast, ESPN Daily, which is an intellectually stimulating, if not mentally and physically stimulating <laughs> daily show where he dives deep into a subject of, we don't know whether it's his choosing or his producer's choosing, but either way, it's always interesting. Pablo and I met through Dan Lebetard and we became fast friends. And Pablo, thank you for joining us. How you doing, man? I'm good. Let me cut some of the puppet strings that my producers use to control me um, every day. You asked who controls the podcast, really. And I'm, I'm a puppet. I am. I'm a person with a hand up my bottom being commandeered and controlled by corporate forces. Obviously. How dare you imply that I am not in control of my own autonomy? Is it the whole fist? Like, is it a Fletch situation? Or have you been, now that you have a new contract, is it down to just the pointer? It's, it's, it's all this. It's, it's, it's the to, the, to the elbow. It's to the elbow, David Sampson. <laughs> That's a good alternative name for your show, by the way, to the elbow. Get right real, elbow. real, real in there. So you're, you're making me, I wasn't gonna go right here, but I have to, you know, we both, I work CBS, you work ESPN. There is an issue that we all have, as you know, <clears throat> where we want aut autonomy. We want the ability to say what we want to say, where we could spend an entire show talking about what happened in Georgia last night, talking sure. about certain things politically. And there are certain things that are taboo. When, when we started Nothing Personal, we said to CBS, you're going to white knuckle it sometimes, just so you know, and you're going to call me when you're angry. But when the numbers get higher, you're not going to cancel me. <laughs> and that is what I thought would be true until I've seen what went on, you know, with ESPN and with Dan, where the numbers obviously were phenomenal. And it turns out that numbers at the end of the day may not mean everything. But when you're making your decision because you just re-upped and it was widely reported that you have a new deal, how much of that do you take into account in terms of autonomy? Because for me, it matters, but I'm not willing to stand on principle to the point where I have to stand on a soup line. Yeah, I, I think we all make that cost benefit analysis every day. I think, by the way, like Dan also did as much as we like to regard Dan, our beloved friend as like the pirate of all pirates. He knew his spots. He was worse at picking them, arguably, than anyone else. Um, that was his his glory and also maybe in some ways his his um, ultimate demise, if you want to call it a demise, and I don't think we should. This is a whole rabbit hole of its own. But anyhow, I would say that I am mindful of where the lines are. But I also think that my job, David, is like to be a journalist and is to be somebody who is, you know, I think of it this way, right? Like ESPN, if they wanted to be a company that was just live rights, they could do that. But if they wanted to be an editorially driven company in any way, a publication of sorts, a new age magazine, a new age newspaper, you need to have people whose job is to speak journalistic truth and speak it with a rigor that demands a clear eyed assessment of what's going on. So on ESPN Daily, for instance, we have done episodes about the NBA's relationship with China, and we did it through the lens of reporters at ESPN, investigative reporters, the Fainaru Wada industrial complex, those investigative dreamboats. We went to them and were able to tell that story, which was, you know, dicey at times, but always through reporting. And so if that's the foundation in the North Star, I feel like I am pretty well defended, but obviously it gets tricky at times. And, you know, we're not naive to that either. You just called yourself a journalist. So mm. that's how you started though. But do you still call yourself a journalist or do you call yourself a <clears throat> TV personality? Do you call yourself a podcaster? What 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 bucket would you say defines you more than any right now? I'm back to journalism, David. I have returned to the hermit crab shell of journalism. I was absolutely a TV gas bag getting makeup every day and all of that for years. And I had stopped practicing journalism 
um, in, in to the degree that I, I used to and that I am again now, but with ESPN Daily in specific, like it's a journalism driven show and that is for good and bad. We are chasing stories with a level of seriousness that I think journalism demands. And that also means that the fun of say, you know, not to put us on one end of the spectrum and Dan on the other, because I love both, obviously, but the truly absurdist, hey, let's say fuck you to sports for a second here and dive in as they just did on their first episode of the new pirate ship yesterday. Let's talk about farting on airplanes for a really long time. I can't do that on ESPN Daily. So what that means, David, is that I'm a journalist again. But do you want to do that? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, I would love to do all of it. I would love to do all of it, but I'm cognizant of like what my job is. And my job at ESPN, at ESPN Daily, is to not talk about farting on airplanes for now. Well, so no, but now you're you're back, you're stepping that back. You say for now as though you longingly want to talk about farting on airplanes. Well, and people may not realize you're a Harvard guy, right? So this is, you're a serious journalist. And I don't necessarily say that as a compliment or an insult, just more as an adjective. So why would you just say for now? For now, because I want to do more with my personal professional life than any one particular bucket. And so it's no secret that I value doing like highbrow and lowbrow. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed about doing highly questionable, for instance, which is like, again, if you're putting all of these things I do on a sort of like matrix of journalism and utter stupidity or silliness or whatever it is, and uh, on the two sort of sides of that, like highly questionable, for instance, is somewhere in between. We'll do a lot of videos of a guy who is hitting himself in the groin over and over again. And I just understand that like, okay, that's for this place and not for that place. But at some point I would like to keep doing or do even more of the other stuff because I, yeah, despite having like the background that I have that would lead one to believe that, okay, this guy is meant to talk in a certain way that may be very serious. I, I, like to do the opposite very often, as you know, as, as, just as your voice enjoyed. really low when you said that, by the way, I, I like am, to do things uh, very serious. I'm a I, serious man. I have a very particular set of skills. Do you, you, do you have, do you have multi octaves in your voice? Is that what you do? Is that what we should do to entertain <laughs> the audience, right? When we're being totally ridiculous and stupid and going to the lowest common denominator of any possible audience, you have your voice crack and break. But when you're doing a story about the NBA in China, you take on, you put the blazer on and you get serious. Maybe that's how people would know. Yes. For, farting on airplanes. <laughs> NBA and China. So was the NBA China issue for you? Because you're... Do you call yourself, by the way, can we say this? I don't know if this is politically correct. Are you Filipino? What do you, how do you refer yeah. to yourself? You nailed it. You nailed it. I am Filipino. My parents are both from the Philippines, born and raised. That is what I am. But within that, like, this is another rabbit hole, like, is a bunch of stuff, right? Like, Asia, writ large, like, I am Asian American. But someone from China has a very different geopolitical history from someone from the Philippines and Japan versus Vietnam and so forth and so on. Like, you know, we're in the people, Philippines, by the way. Lot. Where in the Philippines were uh, your parents born? My dad is from Bacolod City, which is in the south, smaller city. Uh, my mom is from right outside of Manila. So near sort of like major centers. But yeah, we, uh, I'm Have the first one there? in my family. Yes, but I'm the first one in my family born in the U.S. So I've only been there, you know, probably five times in my life and not in a decade, probably, unfortunately. I don't think we've talked about this. Do you know I filmed Survivor in the Philippines? We have not talked about this, and I have many follow-up questions. Many follow-up questions. By the way, you can turn the table and ask as many as you want, but yes, I flew from LA to Manila, and then flew from Manila to Luzon, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. took a two-hour car ride in a blacked-out <laughs> van so the contestants, we wouldn't know where we were like we would know where we were anyway. Hey, this looks familiar. We're in the Cagayan province of the Philippines. I was just here two days ago. And, yes, uh, yes. and we ended up in Cagayan, which is why it was called Survivor Cagayan. Um, yeah, what's your, I have a question for you. What's like your Yelp review of the Philippines? So I found it to be quite fascinating. And I had an opportunity to do what other people did not on my year of Survivor because I was voted out first. 
So I had a little extra time <laughs> not in front of the camera. <laughs> so I was able to navigate Manila in a little more depth than others. What I was taken about is that as a, uh, um, as a non-Yelly and a non-Harvard guy, I'm a badger. Sure. And we're going to talk mm -hmm. Harvard and yell later. because You're a I, real man of the people, David Sampson. That's what I'm I think of you <laughs> as. Absolutely. I am a man of the Big 12 Conference <laughs> or the Big 18, whatever they're called these days. <laughs> the Big so 10, but continue. My, uh, yeah, but they don't have 10 teams. Oh, yes. So they're not yes. the Big 10. It's See, I literally misnomer. thought you had forgotten because I thought you were that fraudulently Big 10. But in fact, you were making a joke. Please continue. It's unbelievable. Totally lost in text. <laughs> So my view of the Philippines was based on shoes. Ooh, like Imelda Marcos? Is that what we're yes. talking about? Yes. Mm. That's what we're talking about. Mm. That is the irony of being an absolute, um, what's the word when you are, this is me every day on the show where Coke has to help me with the word, uh, where you are so uh, uh, in one place so uh, you have a wall around you it's secluded but that's not the word as an american sequestered is no not really sequestered that's not it either but insulated it's insulated is the exact word thank you harvard boy so i was so insulated that my exposure to the philippines was only through articles written and stories about amelda marcos that was it <laughs> i mean she had a giant I think it's a house that was a giant shoe in which she kept more shoes. Like she was that fairy tale unironically come to life. People may not know her, right? I'm not sure that she has, her legacy has lasted. So it's possible that people listening to this don't know. W was she a dictator? What is her, just the president? What's her yeah, title? Yeah, the wife of a despot. And I really should stop talking about this because I have family over there still. And I don't want the, I don't want big shoe to come after me, David Sampson, to be quite honest. But Wikipedia, Amelda Marcos, you will get the gist. Okay. <laughs> of course, Wikipedia is not necessarily always accurate. Journalism, David. Remember, always rigorous journalism from me. Yeah, is that what you did? That is, by the way, is that how you research ESPN Daily? You That's right. By the way, I want to make Wikipedia. something clear. I love doing ESPN Daily. You've already gotten me on various gotcha type questions, despite literally texting me. This will not be a gotcha interview. But yeah, I only go for the footnoted ones on Wikipedia. That is my rigor. Absolutely. That's, that's very quick. By the way, that did you learn that at Harvard? I did. Yeah, I did. That you have to go footnotes only. You have to actually have a backup for what you're saying, as opposed to just having sort of gas baggery where you can say anything and have a hot take because you're told to have a hot take. That's journalism, yeah, right? You can't plagiarize the Wikipedia page. You plagiarize the link that the Wikipedia page is actually sending you to. So can we go back to Harvard? So sure. you're a Harvard guy. And I've got, I had a, uh, two of my, this is, I, I'm going to flex it because I'm proud of them. Uh, my youngest child just got into Yale. And, Whoa. So, and, and my oldest child went to Yale. And we had a lot of, I, my, I love Yale. And I spent a lot of time in New Haven and I worked with a Harvard guy named Mike Hill for mm -hmm. 15 years of my life. And so we would spend a lot of time talking about Harvard v. Yale. So before I talk about Harvard, just curious, did you have a choice Harvard Yale or were you choosing Harvard, Wisconsin? <laughs> I, uh, I applied early to Harvard, which is to say that I um, put all, all my eggs in that basket, trying to demonstrate my fealty kissing their feet. And, uh, and got in and therefore was spared from the rest of that horrible process known as college admissions. Did you take a class with Alan Dershowitz by chance? No, God, no. And I did, I did take classes with various other geopolitically problematic figures though. Um, various treasury secretaries who may not have been vindicated by um, the annals of history, um, various, I mean, the president of Harvard was Larry Summers, um, who I don't know if that name means anything to you, but you know, that Wasn't guy- he followed by Rudenstein? Uh, preceded, preceded <laughs> by Rudenstein. But, but Larry Summers, you know, like, yeah, Wikipedia, that guy, like that was the guy leading the university talking about maybe women aren't that good at math and science. So like, yeah, not exactly surrounded by the brightest of, of, of lights in retrospect when it comes to the uh, ethics of intellectualism, but nonetheless. So do you hide your Harvard background given what you do now when you are talking about farts on planes? Because do you see how that can be known as maybe intellectual snobbery? Because to, the, to, the, to normal people, 
and I talk about this and think about this all the time as I'm trying to <clears throat> walk the nothing personal line that the background that you have without people knowing you. So I know you and I don't associate you with what I would say would be a typical Harvard person. But do you are you conscious of that when you're doing your shows? You know, I, I don't have a choice anymore. I mean, it, it going to going to Harvard in particular, just because it's this brand more than it is like a thing deserving of anything that the brand connotes, like it's impossible to not be stamped by it. And it's a really easy signifier. It's a heuristic. That's again, living up to the caricature that I'm trying to defy here, but it's like, it's, it's just You've a proven shortcut. Your point, by the it's way. Just, I know I'm just going to stop talking now, but it's, it's a not. shortcut to understanding where I come from. And so um, I can play off of that and enjoy playing off of that. And honestly, like it's the reverse, right? Like if, uh, the guy with the degree from the place that you don't expect says something that is atypical of that sort of a person. Like I maybe see more piratey myself, even though in the big 10 or the big 12 or the big eight, like you guys are farting into airplanes a dime a dozen. Well, that's just, by the way, that's called a Tuesday night, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we did for fun. We didn't sit in the library talking about intellectual pursuits. We figured how much can we push the level of the beer bong? until yes. it has to change, right? When do you need, in, at Harvard, you change the water every day. At Wisconsin, <laughs> you say, how far can we go without changing the water? We did so many things that were deeply unsanitary in college. I remember there was one, we had a, I mean, this is not unique to, to me, but like we had a, we had an inflatable pool in our common room and I remember like finals week, senior year, it was just filled with like all manner of alcohol and people, and this isn't even like a thing. I don't think people were like snorting alcohol out of this communal kiddie pool. And when I say snort alcohol, I say that knowing that that doesn't really make any sort of like physics sense, but that is exactly what was happening. So Wait, are you? We're just, just like. Can you. we speak in English for people who may be watching or listening? Are you saying that people were drinking alcohol through their nose? Through their nose, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. out of a out of a kiddie pool in a common room that was. So do you know what kids are doing now, so that they don't they're, they're, that they don't smell of alcohol? Kids are soaking, and this is actually happening. Kids are soaking girls and boys, and we'll we'll talk about the anatomy later. Please are soaking tamp. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even get through it. They're soaking tampons in alcohol, inserting them and getting drunk that way. Yes, yes. I mean, David, anyone who is familiar with butt chugging as a practice knows the coaching tree from which this springs. I mean, the rectum, real good at absorbing into the bloodstream. Ver Why am I... Why am I sort of trying to boast expertise on this? Yeah, I, first of all, I'm, I, I'm following up. Have you ever done it? No, no, God, no. Are you lying? You've never yes, I am lying. used no, the rectum no. as a soaking? Okay. Well, well, hold on, not intentionally. Oh, interesting. By the way, Coco would like to point out, he's yelling in my ear that he thinks we're a bunch of academic nerds. He went to West Virginia and he mm. actually believes he's intellectually superior to us, which he likely is, by the way, on myriad levels. But uh, I mean, he, he wants the to West out Virginia. That, ugh, the, the, I mean, just he went with his siblings, I wish that was my course. I wish that was my alma mater's um, theme song. Why do you even know your alma mater's theme song? Uh, yeah, it sounds vaguely like white supremacist, I believe, it's, if I were to like recite all the lyrics. It's bad. Give, it's not great. Are you an alumni donor by chance? <laughs> I could not hang up on that call any quicker. I donate to my high school, love Regis High School, shout out to them. Um, but yeah, Harvard, man, there's, there's, they don't, they don't, they're so the last two different things need though. anything from me. Are you, do you not give because they don't need or do you not give because you are turning your back on what they represent? Oh, no, 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 no. I just, I just don't give because they don't need my money. I have interviewed for them, for instance. I have like, I've done all of that. I, I'm happy to be an ambassador at times but they don't need my money. Come on. They have, yeah, they have plenty. Can we tell people the funniest experience we ever had? I have to. I mean, there are a couple, I, there are a couple, but I, I, yeah, you go for I, it. I'm just thinking about this. I'm thinking about the fact that when you're, one of the things that strikes me having been in public for as long as I have, and as long as you've been in public is that people have this view 
especially they see you went to Harvard or you're this, you're that. And it's just not really what we're like. We are truly ordinary and normal. So really stupid, I, stupid people, right? We're just, that's what we are. We're just, if we could laugh, that's what we want to do. So Paul and I were out to lunch one day and we walk into a restaurant and we're already laughing walking into the restaurant. You can read into that however you want. Yeah, Everything is going well. Into the restaurant. Yeah, taking absolutely. a stroll into the restaurant, sit down, and, and we're it's sort of a romantic table for two, which I'm not exactly sure. It's like a European small table where there's people very near <laughs> and we're across each other. There's only like 18 inches between our mouths as we're eating, that type of closeness. Correct. And all of a sudden, into the restaurant, right beside us sits Bono. And... <laughs> The reason why that that is so interesting is because the entire lunch then changed. Instead of being about whatever we were talking about or whatever insanity that we were laughing about, it all became about making sure that Bono didn't realize that we were staring at him the entire time. <laughs> More than that, though, I remember at some point, and this was like one of the great lunches I've ever had, to be perfectly honest, um, like 75% of the way through, I like confide to you, I lean... 16 inches from the 18 and I'm like how much have you picked up from what Bono has been saying because I had picked up like very little for all of the reasons alluded to um and you said I've heard everything it, it's quite bizarre because <laughs> you now there are superstars who don't want to be seen right celebrities who try to be sort of incognito they'll wear a hat there were sunglasses Bono walks in as Bono he was dressed up as Bono. He had the the, the you know the purple sunglasses, the hair out, like he he lounging, he, David. Lounging. Right. He was in the True. corner, like spread out, like Jabba the Hut, and it was like you are. And by the way, near the window, remember that people were walking by near, near Central Park. People were walking by, stopping, looking, and acknowledging that's Bono in the window, just like, like hanging the out. Opposite of the Sopranos, he did it in a way which makes me think we never talked about this. Do you think that he gets off on being noticed like that, whereas some celebrities don't ever want to be noticed? Either because he absolutely he does, or he is like um, sort of like on a blindness, a social blindness spectrum that I would not anticipate Bono is, because he had to be. He had to be aware of all of that. I think he knew everything. And I think that he looked at us. I know he looked at us so many times during the lunch because A, we were being, it was sort of a quiet lunch restaurant and we were giggling out of control. It was the otherwise, time. it was silent. otherwise remarkably silent and empty. I feel in my mind's eye, it's just us sitting 15 inches apart from each other, like giggling into each other's mouths. And then Rover there is just Bono who was holding court in ways that seemed irresponsible, frankly. Uh, people were, this is pre-COVID, so there was no issue, but people were coming up to him and he didn't seem all that bothered. But do you, do you get that out now that you, once you were, had your own TV show and now that your platform is much bigger than it was in Massachusetts, do you, even when you were writing, when you started writing after school, do you get that ever? Yeah, I mean, the people who, who come up to me and yeah, but yeah, I, if you're asking me, do I consider myself the Bono of ESPN? The answer obviously is yes. But I, I am approached by people who are foreseeable, who are coming at you from a mile away and you're like, you watch ESPN. You are a male. You are somewhere between the ages of 20 and 49. Let's say that. Let's be a little bit generous. And yeah, you're like probably, I mean, I'm going to, why am I insulting the audience here? I'm not going to, I'm going to stop doing that. You, yeah, I'm just going to point out that it's, it's all, it's never like, it's, 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 it's as you saw, as I, as I crowd surfed upon at Dan's birthday in Miami at Moss, at one of at, at Moss Miami, David, it's all, it's, it's people who look like various iterations of people who work for Dan Levitard and or Dan Levitard. You know, people know me for the Moss Miami because of the FU that I gave. And but what people don't know, because I haven't told the story, <clears throat> is that you are almost 98% responsible for what took place that night <laughs> as it related to me. And it was all entertainment and it was all purposeful. And, and you are manipulative, complete everything for the audience. You will do whatever it takes to get the laugh, to get the listener, to get the That's click. Right. You're, you're a click. I was going to say, is the expression like a click whore? That's a terrible word, but what is the word? Uh, a click sex worker. 
a click sex worker, a click over age sex worker. <laughs> That's what you are. Because I want to be clear. We have to be careful. We've got people watching. And that's what you did to me in Moss, Miami, as we were sort of in Dan's orbit. Are you nervous now to be outside of his orbit at all? No, because I thankfully have like um, other stuff to do. Um, I've all, I mean, look, I came from outside of it. I entered it, rotated around in it, but always had fingers in other pies. Like I am from a larger coaching tree upon which Dan was like this enormous like very um, wide faced fruit, right? Like he like, and then from that fruit sprung other sort of like shoots and, and branches and I'm torturing a metaphor here while also not making any sense. But the sure point is like, the metaphor, the there, is a, okay. there, <laughs> there is a larger tradition that I come from like Tony Kornheiser um, and PTI and Around the Horn and now ESPN Daily and like the writing stuff. Like Dan didn't give me that. Dan though was like, you know, as supportive as any human being has ever been to me professionally. So I miss him, but I can stand on my own, but he is just singular in that way. So I will miss him, but I will be able to be upright. I, I, I take slight umbrage with the last thing you said is that you can be in someone's orbit and still stand on your own. Mm, right. Mm, that is mm. not to me. Those are not mutually exclusive. I, I, that's, that's fair. I, I am a, uh, I'm like an asteroid um, that sort of just like enters various orbits with some sense of unpredictability at times. Um, maybe I'll crash into someone else's planet at some point. I'm not tied exclusively is my point, David, to any particular orbit. I'm not sure that was your point. Did you just come up with that as your <laughs> point? Because when you said you were an asteroid, I'm not sure that asteroids actually have an orbit. Well, they do orbit. Bit or they enter gravitational fields. That's what they, they pass do. They, fall, they that's they pass. Let me Wikipedia. Let me Wikipedia. Could you get to a quick. footnote? Because do do asteroids actually circle anything? I don't uh, believe they I, do. I think they can. I will I argue. Think that's what an orbit is. I will argue that they can. Okay. Certainly. Do you think that Earth could change its orbit and fall into a different orbital field? Mm, can't do that. Well, it is where it is for now. I guess you're saying there could be another bang. That's okay, right. I, I, I got to get something because something happened during COVID. Did it happen during COVID for you or right before COVID? When did you become a father? February 24th, 2020. Um, so literally, literally 15 days before the league shut down. Uh, right. Do I have the math right? March 11th to February 24th? Literally sitting in the room where you exist with your newborn baby and reading on my phone a headline, coronavirus, COVID-19 from China entering United States and remembering that moment and filing it away and still reflecting on that moment, yeah, 10 months later. Are you still at the seaport or are you doing ESPN Daily from your house? I do it from the closet in this bedroom, which is right there, my wife's closet right there. That's where I do ESPN Daily. And has the baby interrupted? Has COVID changed anything? Do you have any interest? Two questions. Do you have any yeah. interest in going back to a studio? So I go to the seaport to do around the horn in a very controlled and safe fashion. Like no one else is there. There's a open sort of like concept office. It's not like a little room. Um, everyone is tested there. So from that perspective, I get a taste of it. I've done PTI filled in from there um, a couple of weeks ago. But in terms of like going into a studio and living there every day, I'm not rushing to do that by any means, man. We're super, super careful and super, super risk averse um, in general. And I find that, yeah, honestly, and this is like, this is not something that I, I necessarily would offer in a negotiation with an employer, but like, I actually do really enjoy just working out of this closet. I Has find there to be like a real, like line, which in the wardrobe dynamic, like, oh, a different world inside here. This is great. I, I never pictured you as someone who would live inside a closet. Normally, I think you'd shoot the doors open and run out like naked on, with your <laughs> hair on fire. You will not keep me in a closet. So wait, has the baby uh, interrupted the show yet? Not yet, but it's coming because she's moving around and making noises and finding her voice and all of those things. And I remember one time early in the pandemic, you FaceTimed me with your shirt off after like running on a treadmill or something and tried to give me fatherhood advice. And I tried to process all of it, but I feel like you warned me about this. Uh, I warned you about a couple things. 
as I recall, because I'm a little bit ahead of you in that, in that my kids are older. And I think the most important piece of advice was not advice, it was actually just a statement that is impossible to understand at the moment, but you understand it an iota at a time for the rest of your life, is that as of February 24th, 2020, your life changed and it will never go back. Ever, ever, no matter what people say, no, I'm gonna go back to my parting ways. I'm gonna go back to being able to go out to dinner whenever I want. I'm gonna be the different guy. How's that working out? It's going real bad, um, but it's also been emphasized, David, by the fact that like, because of the timing of all of this, everything changed. And so like the good and the bad is that there was literally nothing else for me to do. And therefore I got to be the best dad I could be by involuntary means. Like I am around all the time and there's nothing else for me to do. There's no FOMO, which is great. Like. I lost, I mean, high noon, spoiler alert, got canceled shortly thereafter. What? And so, yeah, you wait, I know. You're not on high noon anymore? Uh, it's, it's shocking. Wikipedia, high noon at some point. You um, had something that got canceled? I, I rode that asteroid into my own right. bank account. <laughs> right and, into the ground, actually. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> That's where you took high noon. And, and, and unfortunately, yeah, was in, in, a, in an opposite way was killed by dinosaurs instead of the other way around. I was unfortunately murdered by, by, um, yeah, you'll get that metaphor at some point. Yeah, um, I but, totally get it. Except but, you but the, weren't murdered. Yeah. I, I'm, is done. You have lived to see another day. So the equivalent, again, you're mixing your metaphors. You're not even good with similes. I don't even know if you went to Harvard or Harvard tech, you, the show is done. You are not. Thank you, David. It's I was like just a luring you. No, but it's like you wanted. Oh, for the compliment, was that the cheap that's right? Compliment you wanted. I was, I was, I was mixing metaphors until you came and 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 lifted me in your arms and made me feel better. Thank you. I love you, Pablo. I'll always have you. In my <laughs> arms. So um, why was I? Why was I talking about that? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, the show <laughs> ending, and so like. And so when I lost, when we, when Hanun went away, like everyone also lost everything that they were doing. And so I do feel like there has been this weird like purgatory that I've existed in that we all remain in. And so I don't even know if I've, to answer your question, I don't even know if I've reckoned with everything yet. Like, well, I'm a dad, I have a whole new job. This is all very different, but it's kind of all surrealistic still. The way to see is gonna be that once we get vaccinated, and, and once we're able to go out again, what has changed is that your ability to make plans with friends has permanently been altered because it used to be when you're single that you do whatever you want, whenever you want to with reckless disregard for anybody else's plans, times, anything. Then you get married and that was an issue with us where you would say, hey, I, let me ask, let me just make sure, right? That's one level. <laughs> now it is a whole new ball game in terms of your schedule and what you'll be allowed to do in terms of on your own. And I'm not crucifying or MFing. I was, I was a terrible father. I'm trying to be better as I'm older. I was extremely selfish. I did not take into account anybody else and what they wanted. I just, if, if they wanted to do what I wanted to do, then I did it with them. If they wanted to do what I didn't want to do, then I didn't do it with them. And mm. admitting that sucks, but I am who I am and I did what I did. And it is what it is, which is another expression that I dislike. But in terms of you, you have now set the daddy bar for yourself, for your wife and for your child so high that frankly, you're so screwed as it relates to going forward because you're going to be nothing but a disappointment if you choose to ever have lunch with me again. Yeah, yeah. This has crossed my mind. I mean, you are this like ghost of Christmas future character in my life. Um, who is warning me, uh, this is how it could all, it could all go. But have um, I been yeah, right I, more than I've been wrong, by the way? You, have, you, you know, you've been right. You've been right. And, and that is to your credit. And, and unfortunately, like I used to, I, I was, I was a, an incredibly social person. Um, I, I love to, to go get random lunches um, on, on a random day. Um, that that's I, yeah. So I, I miss and will miss all of that. Like, yeah, man, I am, I'm getting points that, that, uh, as, as a dad that I, I feel are unsustainable, but yeah, the bar, the bar has unfortunately been yeah, set. It also doesn't work. Let me give you another hint that if you think you're building up points and like, you can then cash them in at one point that actually doesn't work. 
<laughs> Look at all the 50 things I've just Wait, I, I should I should not keep this spreadsheet is what you're saying. No. That's not a good idea. Because the the you know how uh, it works with frequent flyer miles and you have a frequent flyer miles and you say to yourself, oh, my God, I've got 50,000 frequent flyer miles. That must be worth a lot. Right. And then you go to exchange them and it turns out like 50,000 frequent flyer miles gets you into a like a drink coupon like that type of thing. That yes. is the exchange rate for your points that you have been accruing. <laughs> they are literally <laughs> They're worthless, Pablo. Par so to recap, parenting is a fake currency that they make in an inflated manner to make you feel better about all the things that you could be doing about your life. So it's not parenting to me. It's the sacrifice. It's the selfless acts that you are undertaking. It's the subjugating your own desires and needs and wants and loves <laughs> to do what others want or what society says you should be. Wait doing. a minute. Hold, hold on. That hold on. You is what you were. You were a bad dad. <laughs> so, it, you know, Dan and I have actually spoke for hours, spoken for hours about this conversation. Uh, I consider myself a I, I was a provider. And I chose work over parenting um, more often than not. But what I also did, which it was bad, is that I wasn't as present as I should be. By the way, do I owe you like $250 after this show? Because yes. you're being great. Like you're being very supportive and it's like you're a therapist. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. This I, I'm covered by, I mean, I'm in network, David. Oh, thank God. I actually, the therapists I go to don't have a network. They just, you put cash <laughs> under the candle on your way out. <laughs> And then you Wait, wash well, your hands. <laughs> you you do subscribe to ESPN Plus, right? This is part of the the bundle. Is That's me it. showing up at your wall. house? Yeah, exactly. I'm behind the wall, <laughs> so I wasn't as present even when I was there. So I was the guy who took pride in always being available when a trade was going to happen. Yeah, of course I'm available, or when a signing, or when something's going on in marketing, sales, or any department, or when I'm trying to start a business in Europe and I just get on a plane for three weeks with a with a child who is you know under one years old and I just disappear to a city, you know, or I go to Asia. I spent you know three weeks in Thailand trying to get a newspaper business going, and I would just disappear. And, um, <laughs> and it's just, as I look back on it, I, ha I thought I had a plan and, and I thought it was a decent plan. And I thought that, that by providing or by doing that, that people would understand or kids would understand. And it turns out that, uh, there are little things you can do that go a long way. So what you're doing now, the mistake is you're going for the bulk purchase. Mm. You you're going for all the points you can get. I'm always around. I'm always present. And I think you've gone too far because in order to recapture even a little of yourself, I think that you're going to have a more difficult time than you believe. My wife is going to potentially like listen to this and she's going to ask me what the name of the show is what? <laughs> like you told me you were going on a show called Nothing Personal with our friend David Sampson. By the way, to recap, like the other amazing meal that is on the metal stand of meals, like the first time I ever met you, was at a dinner that I had booked on the fly for you and your guest and Dan and Valerie and me and Liz, like in Chinatown before the theater, which you had arranged for. And so the vision of David Sampson that Liz and I got was the most perhaps exaggerated version of David Sampson, the guy who could get us tickets to Broadway on a whim in the perfect spot. And also, hold on, actually, I, I don't wanna blame, cause Dan was I'm the one who went back now. to the kitchen. Dan went yes. back to the kitchen or, or not, he, Dan was the one who couldn't eat anything. Correct, well, he, correct me if I'm that, wrong here. That you know that they, they Going out to meals with Levitard is a nightmare. We're aware of that, right? That's just how yes. that goes because of the way. Yes, he, he also, it's fine. He, he, he couldn't eat garlic or something. And it was just like, Dan, we're at like a Chinese restaurant. Like, what are you doing? Like, and then he, we all, he got us to go cups 
So we were all like walking out as if like we were in Bourbon Street, except we were just like in the middle of Manhattan. We all ended up walking and you disappeared for a time on your phone. And we were unclear what was happening. And it was like, is David being a really good dad or a terrible dad right now? It wasn't clear, but then you got us, like we, I wasn't sure, like Liz and I were like talking to them, like how good are these seats gonna be? And the seats were the best seats you've ever had. And it's like, who is this guy? Like, and you were, and you were wearing one of your blazers. It was a lot, man. And that's and that's where I was like, this is not the last time I will encounter this man. No, it w- and actually, I didn't think twice about you and Liz after that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I was like, damn, like, you're really gonna like Pablo. And I, and I said, all right, I'll, I'll go out, it's no problem. And by the way, that whole night started because that you wanted to do something or he wanted to do something for you because he is a very giving guy. And he said, I promise you that you and Pablo are more alike than you think, but it's going to take a moment for you guys to realize it. And yes, uh, yes, yes. It happened. I'm gushing only in that. I I want people to know, first of all, I want them to download and subscribe to ESPN daily. Thank you. Because I happen to love it and I don't spend a whole lot of time. I don't know if you find that. Do you have a huge number of podcasts that you listen to? No, no, no. I mean, I can't, I hate, why are we talking about Levitard this much, man? Like, why are we, I, 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 I was going to pay him another compliment, but just because like, I listen to the podcast of people whose voices like make me feel better about myself. And you are in that category at times. Dan is in that category more than anybody, but like, I, I want this to be parasocial, right? Like this is, this is something that I want to have on in the background of my life because I'm at home all the time now. So no, I don't have a lot, but, but uh, I am particular. Well, you know, you're, you've grown your show during a time when all the listening habits have changed and all the metrics and the way people are engaging in the products of podcasts. Podcasts are obviously blowing up, but without people commuting the way they really didn't do in 2020, the, the fact that you were able to grow it. So people, if you, if you don't know ESPN Daily, which you should, uh, it's okay to learn something. One of the things that we do on Nothing Personal, and at first I was criticized for it, but now we are not, is we're trying to get people to learn something actually. And yes. we can do it in a way that is not Harvard and Yale. You do it in a way that is perfectly easily digestible, but it, yet it gets people to actually think about a position. Do you agree that it is not our job to tell people how to view different things in the political and business and sports world, but it's to give people the tools to make their own decision about those subjects. I think that's right. I think that's right. But it's also embedded in anything I say. Like, I hope that, you know, God, why am I quoting uh, this, this New York Daily News article about first take replacement hosts that had me on it, like as a farce. And they said, he issues highfalutin edicts from the top of Mount Pablo designed to make the rest of us schlubs look like idiots. That was the caricature of me. In so the that New would York be Daily the News. opposite of what that would be the opposite saying. of what you just said. But I believe in what you just said simply because whenever I say anything, it is not meant to be ex cathedra. It's not meant to be papal in its pronouncement. It's like, no, a push Time back out. on me, stop. man. Stop, stop, Coca. Don't even record. He just said ex cathedra in the same breath as trying to say that he's not trying to in any way influence or show his intellect. Come on, man. man. It's just, it's just the gift and the curse is what that really is. Um, But yeah, I, I hope, I hope, I hope David, I hope David that people understand that I will have strong views at times, but mostly I'm trying to provide them with journalistically obtained information or information obtained in your case from a very unique personal experience. If I can throw some love in your general direction into your mouth from 15 inches apart, like you have as much as any other human being I've ever met, a code. You have a sense of how the world, how your world is and should be organized. And through that system, you see everything else. And in this business, I will, I will admit, like, there are times when various of us gas bags in this universe, like, we will be pliable for the sake of some other incentive. You are ironclad in your consistency and in your view, and it is not a view that is arrived at haphazardly or accidentally or lightly. 
It is so deliberate that if you were to open up your brain, people could see how it is that you arrive at every single thing you do. And Dan had hinted at this to me before we ever met each other as like why I would enjoy you. And I underrated and underestimated how much that governs exactly who you are. And to have a code, man, it's like you are at the same time, someone deeply in need of therapy. And here I am for that. But also like, you're kind of like a gunslinger. Like you have it, you have, you have your Hammurabi. You have like, no, this is, this is how the world is. And I really do respect that because more often than not, I find it incredibly fascinating and oftentimes correct. Well, I'll say thank you, but I'll put a question mark next to it because that very thing that you described and that you did describe it correctly, in my opinion, that is, as you would say, both a blessing and a curse. And it happened during my entire baseball career where I would be that way because I am that way. You're 100 percent correct. But very often, and you know this as a journalist and as the personality you are, people would much rather stay in their closet, right? They'd much <laughs> rather not in any way be told that what's out there in the big bad world is actually big and bad, that it's just flowers and, and, and Bono, but it's not. <laughs> and that doesn't make it a bad thing, right? It just means that if you wanna to come to nothing personal, we're not gonna give you any bullshit, right? We're gonna tell you the way it is, the way we think it is, the reason why we think things are happening. And that's one of the reasons why I love your show because I learn and I love to learn. And again, before we close here, and I love this, I could keep going, but I, you gave me 45 minutes and I appreciate that. And that's what we do for our audience. I would just say this, that you are much more than your Wikipedia page. And I will mm. end it with that. Wow, wow. There's some, I'm like, does that mean I should edit my Wikipedia page now? Should I stop editing it? <laughs>